Okay, welcome everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you are today. We have a, a, a crowd of people from all over the world as we have 525 chapters um, located everywhere. So I'm Susan Asadi, and I'm the executive director of the New York City chapter of the Global Chamber, and I'm thrilled to be co-moderating this cross metro meet up about the garment industry with Maymoon Mustafa, our executive director of the VACA chapter. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, everyone may know this, but I just wanted to point out um, the fact that the garment industry, as far as the New York point of view, has been central to the growth and development of our economy here in New York and identity. And at one time, nearly a third of the adult workforce toiled in the garment trade. From roots on the Lower East Side, manufacturers spread all over the city, primarily to the garment district, which extends from 34th to 40th Street, um, from 6th Avenue to 9th Avenue. By 1931, the garment district had the largest concentration of clothing manufacturers in the world. Um, increasingly, in decades after World War II, production moved southwest and then overseas to lower cost areas um, where labor was cheaper and production was cheaper. So um, it's very poignant that today we're doing this event with DACA, which according to our sources ranks number two behind China for offshore manufacturing. And many global retail leaders such as H&M manufacture their clothing lines there. So um, I'm sure we're gonna hear more detail from our speakers from DACA. And um, I would now like to go to um, our first expert out of New York, who is Jasmine Sandler. Um, oh, but be before that, if you're not one of the speakers, if you could please mute your microphone, I'd appreciate it. Um, but first, we're going to have now Jasmine Sandler speak. She's heralded as a warrior woman in business and is the founder and CEO of JS Media, a branding and marketing agency supporting the development and growth of female brands from executives to artists, and the creator of the Warrior Women in Business Casual Clothing Line and Event Series. She's also um, a leading uh, digital marketer, and she will tell us more about this. So Jasmine, without further ado, if you could speak, and each speaker will um, present from between five and seven minutes. Thank you. Sure. Well, good morning or good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, hopefully, everybody can hear me just fine. I'm donning our newest uh, Warrior Women uh, design. And I got to say, I'm very pleased to be on this webinar. I'm very pleased to be a part of the, the fashion and garment industry. So I just want to give, a, I'll just give a little bit of kind of a background of how I've got here today and a little bit also about um, the changes that I see, uh, not only as someone that has a fashion line, but someone that's involved in branding. Uh, and marketing other fashion lines today and where I see this is going. So just a quick snapshot, the reason that Warrior Women in Business actually exists is because, uh, as Susan mentioned, I'm a keynote speaker and trainer and have been for almost 20 years now in the digital marketing industry. And over the last 10 years, I saw more and more of a need to support uh, this growing segment of the economy in the United States, at least, which is uh, female entrepreneurs and particularly entrepreneurs that want to go on their own and build their own brands and what we call DIY it. So my job there is really to help and provide education and coaching. So uh, in 2016, I was speaking at the Women's Leadership Executive Conference and found that there were all these female entrepreneurs that really wanted to get their voice heard. So I started Warrior Women actually as a podcast and the podcast was to invite leaders from cross industry to provide education and training to budding female entrepreneurs that wanted their own brands. Flash forward a few years later, the character of the podcast became pretty popular. And um, and I was running a conference in oh, 2018. There it is. Hey, Jorge, how are you? Pre-COVID uh, in 2018. Hey, uh I'm sorry, I'm hearing some uh, voices there. I don't know if someone else is on and they want to go mute. But anyway, so back to what I was saying. Uh, in 2018, I was running a conference for women and, um, you know, someone said to me, you know, you've got a great brand in Warrior Women. Why don't you do something else with it? So I, I have this always had this love for fashion and style and I have a, a big um, passion for supporting people in the arts and people that and, and art entrepreneurs, as we call them. And so I started this brand Warrior Women in Business. Um, as really just a casual 
clothing line to, you know, help kind of armor female entrepreneurs out there while they're going through their daily kind of struggles of running a business. And now I've taken the brand and I think why Susan asked me to be on today to um, use it to support other uh, women and also men in the fashion industry um, to help them to invite them and be involved in warrior women events. Uh, I think that what I've developed is more of like a collaborative uh, media point for female entrepreneurs and women in the arts to kind of come together and help each other grow their fashion brands. And as an example of that, um, I have several pop ups coming up here in New York where it's not just my brand at all. I'm bringing together all these other women, uh, female entrepreneurs in fashion and women in the arts so that all of them can have visibility. And I and as someone that's involved in branding some of these clients, I have seen definitely through COVID the struggles and changes that have happened through your supply chains. And I would like to be a part in kind of supporting this and in being the point where I can help to display some of these growing fashion brands. So that's what Warrior Women in Business is all about. Uh, we have, you know, I would say up to 20 different designs. You know, again, it's a very casual brand. Um, we are looking at licensing the brand with other uh, fashion manufacturers uh, and using the brand to also raise money through charitable events that we're producing for uh, women in the arts and women in health in New York City. So that's a little bit about what I do. And I'm happy to take questions or Susan, if you have anything specific. Yeah, I just have a couple of questions for you, Jasmine. Thank you. Um, you self-manufacture and distribute. Can you tell us a little bit why, um, why you do that and what are the benefits of being a self-manufacturer? Yeah, so, you know, I, um, <laughs> As I've gone down this journey with Warrior Women in Business, uh, you know, one of the things that I really we're doing now is we're we're looking at taking this into a really lifestyle brand. So we're doing things like designing wetsuits and things, snowboards. We're getting into like this fun sport angle. So anyways, I've been on the phone in the last year with so many uh, menu, niche manufacturers from kind of everywhere. And I wasn't really I didn't feel that I could touch and feel things. I didn't feel like I was part of the process. So I just started connecting with, uh, you know, women that I know that have fashion brands in New York and they started to introduce me to local people. Uh, and I started working with them and then we actually purchased a heat press here. Um, so we do all the t-shirts like you see this, we do this internally. And I just wanted to, I don't know if the word is control, but I wanted to kind of understand the process better. And I wanted to deliver a quality of product that I could stamp warrior women on that I felt good that a woman could wear. And that was, that's really why. Uh, you're on mute, Susan. Yeah, I got it. Um, where did the Warrior Women line come from? I know you mentioned a little bit about it earlier. Is there anything more you wanna add about that and who it serves? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a funny story. Um, and I'm sure you all have a lot of uh, experience in licensing. So uh, when I started this brand, it was actually called Wonder Woman in Business. And we had this very cool 60s take of Wonder Woman. Uh, and uh, funny enough, a lawyer at, at Warner Brothers contacted me in a very polite way and said, I love your podcast, but you can't use the name. <laughs> so I said, that's fine. I'm flattered that you actually contacted me. So we changed the name. I, this is all trademark now. But the whole intention is uh, of Warner Woman, where it, where it really came from is to provide a like a point of empowerment. I don't really like buzzwords, to be honest with you, Susan, but when people, I've had 37 guests now on my podcast, and every guest I ask them what they think warrior women means, and every single woman has a different take on it, a different perception. But at the end of the day, the two common words that I hear around it are strength and beauty. And I think as a woman myself that's owned a business for so long, it's nice to be reminded that we are strong and beautiful and it keeps us going. So that's what it's all about. And then just one short thing on, on pop-ups. You said, you know, you have a pop-up coming up soon. Is this happening more and more with small retailers? They're doing their own pop-up rather than being in a retail space? Oh my gosh, so often, Susan. Um, yes, it's just, it's happening everywhere. And I see also this trend in kind of collectives of women coming together because I, I, we just did a pop-up a couple of weeks ago at Luminary, which is uh, the co-working space. I mean, it's all women. I do a lot of events there. And, um, and I saw it was pretty light, you know? And so we started to plan together future pop-ups. 
I also see in the real estate, we all know in the real estate industry, right? Uh, it's really, it, it has to change with the times. And so the uh, real estate, because I've also done work in that industry. And so in that industry, they're looking for innovative ways to lease their spaces, right? So the world of pop-ups is not going away at all. I think it's really going to be an innovative way to drive revenue for multiple industries. Excellent. Okay, we may have some more questions for you, Jasmine, at the end, but we're gonna move on now to our next speaker from New York. Thank, Thank you very you. much, appreciate it. So our next speaker is Kurt Cavano. He's the CEO of Nimbly. It's an on-demand 3D knitting platform that matches supply with demand, turning products around in less than one hour. Prior to that, Kurt was the CEO and founder of Tradecard GT Nexus, the largest supply chain platform in the world used by the apparel industry. And he serves on the board of the American Apparel and Footwear Association. So I'd assume he would have some good context about what's going on in the apparel industry, um, both in New York and overall in the US. And also I overheard him speaking to um, Maymoon uh, Mustafa about having traveled to Baca. So maybe you can share a little bit about your business and about your work with um, our Cross Metro co-host here. Please go ahead, Kurt. Fantastic, thank you, Susan. And thank you to everybody listening in. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I know it's a time zone challenge for some of you. So this is uh, great to see so many people. As Susan said, um, before, I, before I joined Nimbly as the CEO, I spent the last 20 years of my career building a software company for supply chain called TradeCard, which became GT Nexus, which those of you in India and Bangladesh, a lot of you are probably using right now because most of the American... Most of the American if you're There's not a, if you're not speaking please mute mute your microphone well, i thought that was just cheers there so okay. that's all good um <laughs> so uh um many of you are probably using that platform uh and uh it's for for optimizing the supply chain because as many of the big u.s brands and retailers are using that uh to to run things and we built that platform because there was a trend over the last 20 years where garment manufacturing was moving further and further offshore. And there was a real need to try to optimize the process and also optimize the finance. And that was another big piece of what we were doing is providing a supply chain finance on the platform so that manufacturers could, could get access to cheaper capital. And it was very, very successful and um, sold that company. And after thinking about the supply chain and what's going on, I, I joined a little startup called Nimbly who was completely rethinking the supply chain from the other way, instead of trying to figure out how to go as far away as you possibly can, which is how to build a micro factory and, and do things more on demand. And, and nimbly what we do is we do on-demand knitting, uh, computerized knitting on what's called a stole or a Shimaseki flat, uh, machine to do on-demand garments. And what we realized very quickly is while doing on demand and doing it local was great and it's really it's really amazing how an order can come in over the internet and you can knit it and deliver it in two days um, to think that you you don't have any working capital you don't have any you know anything other no risk because you're making it on making it as it's being ordered it became very clear that that would not scale very well and while there's a big movement in the US toward building out micro factories and local production, the overseas manufacturing, whether it be Bangladesh or India or China or Vietnam, needs to be an integral part of the supply chain. But what we've found that really changes the proposition is thinking differently about what you order and how you order. In the past, the model with, with retail was, I do a design, and I, six months in advance, I order a container load of stuff that's going to come from the other side of the planet into the U.S., and I hope it sells. And a lot of it sells, some of it gets discounted, and some of it gets thrown away. And that's not a, and that's not a great model for the environment. It's not a great model for, for actual total profitability. And so what we're doing at Nimbly is we're actually connecting together the factories so that we can do small production in the U.S., test what sells best of a garment, which color, which sizes, which embellishments. Do that locally in the US so you have a low risk way to test what's actually happening. And then once you identify what's selling the best, 
move those orders overseas so that they can be made in bulk at a cheaper price. So the initial orders you manufacture are more expensive, but you have very low risk because you're doing small quantities. Once you see what's selling, you go overseas and manufacture in Bangladesh or China or Vietnam, wherever, and that allows you to get scale and pricing power, but much reduce your risk because you know what's going to sell. And we are getting incredible traction with that model because the brands and the retailers were so caught off guard by, by um, COVID. They ended up in a situation where they had lots of inventory that they didn't want and none of the inventory that they wanted. And they realized that this really long supply chain without being very thoughtful about what you want to buy is a really bad situation to be in. And so, so in some ways, the COVID situation has been a great wake up call for the brands and the retailers as they think about their supply chains and how do they reduce working capital? And at the same time, how do they really service their customers to make sure that they have all the right goods there and make sure that they actually have things that they can sell, but not the wrong stuff that they're ending up have to discount or get rid of. And I think it's a very different model. The reception has been fantastic. We've got um, just in the first year, we have five uh, US brands that are up and testing the platform. And we expect as we build the software out over the next year to scale this uh, pretty quickly. Um, and so um, we'll be coming to uh, coming to cities uh, all around the world as we as we roll this out. And as Susan said, as I was talking to Maimon, um, in my prior life, I spent quite a bit of time traveling around the world, whether it was in, we had an office in Bangalore and an office in Shenzhen. We had a small sales office in Dhaka and I spent some time with, in Dhaka as well. Um, and actually was part of the Chamber of Commerce's, uh, one of the meetings that was at the uh, Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers Export Association. So um, I think that there's incredible opportunity for um, the, the for manufacturing, and I, I think that Bangladesh is well poised to be able to take advantage of that. And I just you know think that the, it's it's all about how you embrace technology and and think about change. So I'll stop there, Susan, and open it up and see if you have any questions. Yeah, I mean, I think you and I discussed a couple of ideas um, in terms of questions. Um, just anything else you want to say about implications for manufacturers in Bangladesh, and you might want to address India as well. For you have Lokesh on from India, um, and also any advice on how they can stay competitive beyond technology. So I think the I think the interesting thing that we've seen is um, this big rush over the last ten years of manufacturing out of China into both India and Bangladesh. Um, it's been it's been great. Bangladesh, I think, has grown from I think if my numbers are right, close to 20 billion to more like 30 or 35 billion in um, garment manufacturing over the last seven years. And we're seeing I know that I, I saw somewhere there was a target for 50 billion um, for garment manufacturing. And we've got a ways to go to get there. And India has had the same. We've seen this kind of movement out of China into India. We're also seeing a big movement out of China into Vietnam. I mean, in the last year, there's been a big movement. And part of it is due to uh, tariffs and part of it is due to political tensions, if you will. But I think also part of it is just manufacturing capabilities. And I think for Bangladesh and India, the, from my interpretation is the couple of things that need to happen to be more successful or to continue this growth is try to move up the scale of, of of the manufacturing um, uh, what are, technology, if you will, you know, going to more high, uh, high input garments um, from less input garments. And I think that's gonna be one of the real keys. The other thing that I think is gonna be very important and is part of what we're doing at Nimbly is really working hard on how you could bring minimum order quantities down. Uh, because I think the other big wake up call with the um, pandemic was doing these very, very large runs, unless the goods are very basic, is going to change. And so we're going to see more pressure to do smaller runs of garments um, so that we don't have this big hangover of inventory. 
And so I think there's a lot of work that can be done in the factories in both Bangladesh and India about how do you do optimization so you can so that you can go to smaller uh, um, smaller runs of, of goods and get your minimum order quantities down. That requires a lot of engineering work, a lot of optimization in the factory, but I think it can something that can absolutely be done. Um, but it's going to be as we go forward. Um, something that's really, really important. Now, you're going to be still always be making black basic t-shirts and things like that in larger runs, but more fashion items are going to be smaller ones. An interesting, an interesting statistic for people to just kind of get their heads around, if you're familiar with the Chinese company Xi'an, which is like this huge growing company than in the U.S., their average item is only, they only make 300 pieces of each. Um, and they use AI to see what the consumer is looking at and what they're buying. They only make 300 pieces. And so you can imagine the factories that need to really rethink how they produce if you're going to go to that model where you're doing lots of small production rather than the giant runs. It's harder, but it's, also, it's more sustainable. Right. So there you go. Okay, Kurt, thank you very much. We may have more questions for you um, either directly or through the chat. So I'm now going to pass um, the hosting to Maymoon Mustafa um, and he can introduce his speakers from Vaca. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Susan. It was lovely to uh, hear from Jasmine and Kurt. And I, I think Kurt sets up uh, this linkage really well uh, with his experience in Bangladesh, which was uh, very pleasant to hear today. So uh, I'd like to start off today with my first speaker. And um, I've known this individual since I think uh, we were very, very young. We went to the same school. I think we grew up and I've seen him develop as a second generation entrepreneur uh, in the RMG industry. His name is Mahir Manan and he's joining us uh, today. And he's an RMG entrepreneur who is looking for business opportunities to create multi-business conglomerates in many sectors around the whole world. So he does look global. He wants to base IT and smart manufacturing techniques to build a new and improved factory system. Uh, he would like to work on uh, the IT as well as development and footwear manufacturing sectors. Uh, he wants to provide new insights and wants to know how to grow across different kinds of workforces. Maher, you've got five to seven minutes. Please let us know what all the amazing things you're doing. Uh, thank you very much, Mahi Mumbai. Uh, good evening from Dhaka. Uh, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, it's an amazing opportunity to speak to you all. So basically, let me give you a brief introduction of myself. My name is Mahir. Uh, I am the serving as the Deputy Managing Director of Shangu Tex Limited. We are a very old woven garments factory. So basically, by woven garments factory, we make shirts and pants. And mainly we work with shirts and all the types that we wear regularly. Um, our factory was founded, our company was founded as a family business in 2000s. And since then, we have uh, taken huge strides from a five-line factory to making a 25-line factory right now. We have two factories basically right now. What we do is we are approved by Better Work. We are approved by the RSC. We're approved by ILO. So we're building a factory that after the whole Rana Plaza collapse and everything, we are making a factory that is um, strong, sustainable, and would actually um, give buyers and customers around the world a security that their, host, their production is happening in a very safe location. Um, other than that, we host very many different brands. Uh, we mainly do Japanese manufacturing. So um, we work with Muji in, from Japan. Uh, we're doing a lot more brands from Americas and Europe. Um, from America, we're working with Hot Topic. We're working with um, Burnett. And we're also working with um, um, different brands from Europe, such as New Yorker. We're working with Bell & Bow. We're working with quite a few others. So uh, we're not just uh, stopped here. What we're doing is basically when we think of a factory, we think of a sweatshop type of a manufacturing setup. What we're doing is we're trying to build a smart factory. So in our factory, we run everything to, uh, through IT. So everything is run through our computer systems. Everything is designed through our CAD. Everything is designed through our 3D. Everything going forward, our quality is controlled through the Zilingo MES system, which is from Singapore. 
Um, we are also going forward and thinking like China that um, we have to start doing more value added products. As China moves away from garments manufacturing and other kinds of lower value products and into IT and to bigger sectors, what we are seeing is that there's a huge influx of orders into Bangladesh. And as, this order, as these orders come in, we see that uh, more value added products are being sought after. So in that case, so we have started manufacturing um, swimwears and going forward, uh, we're looking to manufacture jackets, um, different kinds of bottoms and the different kinds of more value added products in the near future. Uh, we prioritize quality for sure. And that is why we're doing Japanese manufacturing. Um, our, we have always been good with our quality standards and we have always had standards that match with many, many different companies. Um, going forward, we're uh, working with um, Hot Topic right now. We're getting Lane Brand on board for the swimwear project. And we're like one of the first factories that have started swimwear in Bangladesh. And going forward, we see the future as a bright place and Bangladesh as the best sourcing destination. So yeah, that's about it for me. So any questions, I'm more than, more than welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Mahir. I think uh, yeah. that's a lot in your a great representation of what Bangladesh has to offer the global uh, arm industry as a whole and what the new generation of uh, arm entrepreneurs has to offer. I do have one right. question for you. I mean, uh, I, I think right now I can look at 61 people in this conversation. It's an amazing meetup. So who would be the connections that you would like to uh, connect with going forward? And what do you think the new generation of uh, Bangladeshi entrepreneurs are looking for to connect, especially with uh, the East Coast or North America? Um, being honest and being completely open to you, I would be saying that the new generation of entrepreneurs in Bangladesh, the second generation and all the people that we're here, I'm a second generation entrepreneur and I'm surrounded by people who are like-minded. And what we see is a very different way of going forward. What we see is we are more focused into developing tech, developing a system which is more automated, which is smarter where everyone in Bangladesh, you can see most second generation entrepreneurs, they're all focused on building smart factories. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to um, put up screens, put up different kinds of displays and going forward, they're also trying to use manufacturing in the, the most smart way possible. So for example, we are using a quality MES, uh, management information system, which is basically checking every single element of the garment manually and like putting in the data into the system. So that gives us a real time update and that way we can share with our clients as well as our um, ourselves that how fast we can take care of problems and that keeps our quality in check. Going forward as well, we're working with um, a complete um, IT system, which is basically our ERP, our enterprise resource solution. So what that does is our ERP is completely made, tailor-made for our factory. So going forward, what that does is it makes us, from sourcing the order to booking different items, such as the fabric, the threads, the buttons and everything going forward, that just puts everything in a very um, systematic way. And what that will ultimately do going into the smart factory system, what it will ultimately do is it will bring down a lot of costs and it will make up a good looking as well as a factory that is a safe working environment as well as all the automations that come with it is going to start reducing the manpower so that it's going to help people rather than doing small jobs do more value added tasks such as one person, for example, one person is just using a sewing machine to sew the cuffs and collars. This person can be able to control three, four machines at the same time by automation and by all these systems that are coming in. And going into your first question, who would I like to meet? I would like to meet like-minded individuals who are looking at a smart factory setup or thinking of manufacturing in a smart factory 4.0 system and going and thinking of the next 10 years of manufacturing, thinking of how they can make a green factory, how they can build on everything. Because after Rana Plaza, uh, Bangladesh's reputation for garments has gone very down. And afterwards, we, it's always been referred to as a sweatshop third world country, which is not the case at all anymore. I, have, I, from experience going around the world 
as uh, as blessed as my life is i have seen factories in um, in china in india i've seen factories in pakistan and uh, what i've seen is we are building a nicer and a better setup in bangladesh now because everyone is thinking of the future and as you may already know bangladesh has more the most green factories in the world so that is a wonderful achievement for us to have Excellent, Mario. That's a lot of uh, great insight and a lot of realistic insight going forward. And I already see, I think, a lot of synergies between you and Kurt. And I'm sure you guys maybe can, uh, you know, play Yeah, I, I, as I was speaking, as I was listening to Kurt, I could tell that there's so much he knows and there's so much I could learn from him, as well as he has so much insights into Dhaka. That is, that's completely amazing. Thanks so much, Mario. Um, I can, we'll uh, try to address some questions offline for you. Uh, I do know yeah. that you you might need to go today. You are rushing. Oh, I, 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 it's okay. It's okay right now. You're so here with us. Excellent. So we'll, right now. we'll come so back with you for some more questions. Okay. Yeah. I'll move on to my next speaker right now. And, you know, just like uh, I think uh, Susan had a little bit of variety with Jasmine today with some digital marketing experience. I wanted to bring in uh, one of my core members, Mr. Imtiaz Ahmed. Now, Imtiaz Bhai is somebody um, very, you know, much at heart Bangladeshi. He also resides in the U.S. and he's in the event management sector. Uh, he does a lot of great things. He's also involved in agriculture and in some of these uh, areas of activations uh, that he has done in the past, they've also worked with uh, RMG. Their company's name is Limla, Limbra Trade Fairs and Exhibitions Private Limited. So in this way, welcome and uh, we'd love to know more from you. Thank you, Maimoon. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to join you guys this time. Um, yes, uh, as Maimon said, um, I, I have been running this company, Limbra Trade Fairs and Exhibitions, for over 12 years. And we have um, showcasing different industries in, through this um, organization. So one of them are trade, uh, like um, garments, related like garments machineries, then print tech, label expos, non-oven expo, um, yarn and fabric accessories, also like leather, leather sectors. So we have been uh, showcasing all these uh, sectors to the world, to the different um, buyers and manufacturers around the world in Bangladesh for the last 12 years. So we have been like presenting Bangladesh, Bangladeshi products and Bangladeshi manufacturing to the world for the last 12 years. And we have been doing it with, uh, uh, with our expertise. Very recently, I um, started a garments importing and distribution facility in USA. So I'm also, since I've been in this industry for a while, so I, I learned a lot about exporting and importing. So I get into this business as well. My company name is Trends USA. We are doing the trendy um, fashion uh, clothings. So yeah, I, I'm really like really uh, very happy to learn from Jasmine, Kurt and Mahir about um, the garment industry. As I said, I'm very new in this, but I've been you know, learning a lot. Uh, Bangladesh garment industry is booming. You know, everybody knows like it's almost like 40 years. We started uh, like, uh, like in early eighties, the garment industry is, has been expanded a lot and we have been a very matured industry. We have a huge population. And uh, it, like, it, it's a really good thing that uh, manpower, it is a like plus for us. And uh, like we can compete with all other countries just because our manpower is really, really um, reasonable. And also, as I said, that even though USA doesn't uh, give the GSP facility to Bangladesh, still Bangladesh is a big, big biggest player in exporting garments, like manufactured, manufactured product to US. I think it is the second largest exporter to the US in terms of garments. And in 2021, I believe this, they did really good, almost like 20% up from last year 
which is nine eight billion to nine point six billion dollars in first quarter of like exporting garments. So it is it is a really good um, opportunity. So what I'm trying to do here in USA, I the, the Limbra Trade Fairs we've been doing this in Bangladesh for the last twelve years. I just move it to USA. I'm trying just because of COVID, we cannot uh, be successful, but uh, my target is mid uh, the, the summer 2022 to start my exhibitions, uh, focusing Bangladeshi garments, leather sectors and other industries as well. And same time, I want to promote my own <laughs> brand, uh, which is Trends, uh, Trended Clothings. So uh, my, my intention is to create a consortium where my Bangladeshi brothers, Bangladeshi manufacturers, they can showcase their product. Maybe a permanent one, permanent, um, you know, like warehouse or maybe a storefront there where they can come. Because all of, like all the buyers all over the like world have their office, have their setup in New York, which is just across my office. So I know. There are over 4,000 buyers' office in New York City in fashion industry. And our like manufacturers, Bangladesh manufacturers, can get the advantage of this if they have a like, foothold in, in USA. So my intention is like, yes, we are planning to do the exhibitions in New York, New York or California, uh, of course, in Canada and Mexico. And uh, my intention, as I mentioned, that I want to do a permanent setup where we can make a consortium. We can uh, invite all the manufacturers who can join us in, in New York to have their own like a show, like a you know, um, like a storefront or showcase their product. Yeah. Because I've been to um, Text World every year for the last three years, and very surprisingly, I see there's none like Bangladeshi. Um, many manufacturer or distributors participate there. In, even in magic shows, I don't see like many Bangladeshi um, manufacturers are participating. So that is a thing we can promote through our platform or through any other platform. Like if we can like, promote our product, definitely there's a huge market in the USA. Thank you for this one. I think that was a lot of, uh, you know, further insight into what the potential of the Bangladesh market or the government's uh, proposition is to the international market. One very short question uh, before we uh, head back to Susan. <clears throat> um, in the you know time to come, I mean, as we open up uh, with COVID getting out of the way, uh, what's the potential of organizing trade for, especially in the R&D industry? Are hybrid models uh, more important? Do online models work or do people prefer to actually physically meet? Uh, I would say hybrid model is much better because online or virtual, it, it is not that effective in like RMG sector because people want to feel, touch and feel the product. That is very important. It is not we are, we are, we are selling manuf like uh, machineries or technologies. We're selling the finished product, right? So people, they want to feel and touch the product themselves. So I would say hybrid model would be much better and in person would be the best in this industry. But you know, where there's like a, um, this COVID situation is there. So a lot of people they do virtually, it is not bad, but I, I feel that in person would be much better in, in this industry. That's why we're waiting. That's why we're, we're targeting maybe like the summer 2022, we'll start our first um, exhibition. Thank you, so thank you, Michael. Will... Thank you for yeah. Thank you for giving me the we'll opportunity. Go back to you hopefully uh, if we have time uh, towards the end. Now I'd like to introduce a very special guest here today, um, a regional uh, sister country, sister city, uh, someone from New Delhi. We have Lokesh Parashar joining in. Now Lokesh uh, is a civil engineer by edu uh, by education. He does have a diploma in export management, and as such, he's an export import consultant uh, who helps manufacturers, factories, and others who uh, import and export opportunities. Now, his uh, forte is to help factories establish their sales and distribution in the US. He has 27 years of international marketing experience. Uh, he's very active socially. He's written 
a book on international business relationship. He has shared several articles on LinkedIn, Clubhouse, about market products and services overseas. Now, personally speaking, um, he's right now working on uh, developing the Federation of Buying Agents, FBA, with the mission to connect 5,500 plus buying agents in different industries across South Asia. Hopefully, we'll also benefit from that in Bangladesh. Um, and right now, he's uh, running a group of import export professionals in Delhi and Mumbai having 4,500 plus members. Um, I think I can go on and on, but I will leave it to Lokesh to introduce himself and let us know more about the opportunities. Over to you, Susan. Thank you, Maimon. Susan, hi, Doug. We couldn't say hello to you before. And uh, so all our global audiences, it's a happy moment that 15 out of 62 or 63 participants are actually from India. So that's a tremendous reaction on Global Chamber webinars in our community. Uh, I have uh, taken a few notes of whatever have been said before. So before I can start what I want to deliver as an, as an audience, a very important topic. Uh, we are hearing of uh, AI technology, competitive, uh, good labor, efficient labor, and all those things which are really, really important for the ready-made garment industry. But I would focus on my light on uh, a very critical and something very concerning uh, point for all of us. And before that, let me introduce the Federation. We are a buying agent community, and as most of the factories know, buying agents are global business ambassadors who are talking to the buyers and bringing the business to respective countries, whether a buying agent is in India or Bangladesh or Sri Lanka or in China. We primarily are supply chain managers who are on the ground fighting for the interest of the customer for their all kinds of supply chain issues. In 2020, Federation actually went ahead and did more than 255 online webinars in the three months of lockdown in India, just to lead the light in the dark tunnel for all the community members, whether they're exporters or buying agents or even buyers. And then we created a payment recovery system as well, because we knew that these disputes are going to be really, supply chain disputes are going to be really, really high when goods have stopped at all levels. So, and successfully, I have, we have our treasurer, Ms. Bhavna Singh also joining this meeting. We have close to 85 disputes internationally of payments, whether it is from the buyer or it's from the buying agent or it's from the exporters. Out of that, 15 have been recovered and settled on the win-win situation. Now, coming to my take on the RMG industry webinar. See, we have to, we are all following the global trends. And hence, once we say that we are following the global trends, we also have to see the global challenges, especially when we are talking about ready-made garment industry, which is the most important. And the, it affects all the living beings in the world, whether they're living in sea, land, or air. I'm not talking about only consumers. I'm talking about planet. I'm talking about animals, viruses, and, and all those things which are actually in our environment. And I, as I said, in physics, we have learned in our, in our in the school level, every action has its own reaction. So, and now we as a global family, because everything is in the open air and there are, the environment is boundaryless now. So we are traveling, uh, uh, borders are so close, so much migration is happening across countries. A uh, lot of people would say that uh, China has the maximum people of people migrating from China or, or any other country. So it's a global family now. You can't have borders, you can't have uh, walls, especially when you're talking about environment. And as you must have seen in the last two decades, especially the last decade, you must have seen of global warming and climate change and environmental effects and all those things. Guys, as a ready-made garment industry, when we are focusing on our competitiveness, on our pricing, on our scale of business growth, uh, uh, I would say market uh, percentage, market penetration, please be serious about net zero effect of what we're doing now. Because what I am focusing on right now, and I would like to take your focus on is the challenges of fast fashion against slow fashion. Because we want to be competitive, we want to earn more money, we want to be rich, we want to be doing everything else. What we are doing to the environment, and everyone, I'm not blaming India or Bangladesh or Sri Lanka or US or Europe. Every individual as a consumer, what are we doing? We have to think about it. If we are 
if you're looking at changes in our manufacturing, if you're looking at competitiveness and technology, let us see what is the net zero effect my factory or me as a buyer or me as a consumer is living, is leaving in the society. Now the survival of the fittest, which is always has been the, I would say the formula of uh, human mankind, the survival of the fittest will be who can beat the environmental impact. Previously, it was your food, it was your education, it was your smartness. In the next new world order after post-COVID, the guys who are smart enough, who can actually save themselves from environmental impact, they will be only the fittest to survive. So coming to the solution, I have already told you what the problem is. Coming to solution, the solution lies with the buyer. As a factory or as a buying agent, I cannot drive my manufacturing unit, my labor or my production towards what I believe personally, maybe an environmental activist, but I have to also earn money. So it has to be consumer driven. It has to be buyer driven. So if we are 64 people here, we are 64 consumers. And together with us, we have 64 buyers. Maybe few of us are connected to customers. Let us focus on what is the net zero effect our decisions of buying or decisions of selling is coming to the environment. As we have already seen, we are doomed for severe health problems if we do not rise to this issue as an industry. This is, in, this is the perfect example of, I, and I don't blame any one particular country. Uh, my philosophy, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an environmental uh, background person, but I'm just a lay, plain layman person. I saw encroachment on the virus world by humans. So the nature empowered the virus to be stronger enough and imbibe themselves and survive themselves in the human mankind. And this is not going to stop. The more we are protecting, the more we are looking at uh, all the manufacturings and competitiveness and price and fast fashion and repeating seasons, we are going to actually harm our environment, water, air. So I don't mean that, don't know what it means for you, but I am sure you will realize what I am talking about in another 10 years. I'm happy to answer any questions about my statement. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Loresh. Um, it's a lot of insight uh, for us to go into. And uh, I think I'll hand over back to Susan so that she can moderate this segment, open up some speakers and uh, ask some questions. Susan, back over to you. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Maimoon and Lakesh and our other speakers from DACA. Very enlightening. Um, I did want to give Doug Brunke a minute to speak. Do you have a couple of minutes to speak? And then I'll pass it to some of our attendees. Did you have something to say, please? Our founder? <laughs> thank you, Susan. Always, always a pleasure. I'm just so excited to be in this room. Uh, there's so many talented people from around the world uh, we love at Global Chamber to bring light to markets and opportunities that uh, bring uh, people success. And so we're seeing a lot of success here in this segment, and all of you are representative of that. When we look at 2022, I think we need to heed uh, uh, where the market's going. And I think Lokesh's uh, comments are very timely and very important, and one uh, in comments and ideas that we should I'll listen to very carefully. Thank you, Maimun, and thank you, Susan, for putting this together. We really appreciate your leadership and bringing all of these uh, leaders uh, to, to converse about, hopefully, maybe for, uh, I think, the first time we've talked about this market. You know, let's, let's continue the dialogue. Uh, Maimun, and you in particular have brought together some really interesting market opportunity discussions. I remember when you put together the seafood conversation I thought, wow, nobody's going to come to that. That had over 200 people. You know, sign up. I was, I was floored, you know, by what you were able to do. So let's keep up the progress in 2022. So much opportunity for us to capture. Not to be too optimistic. I think we're all now trained not to be too optimistic, but hopefully realistic, and also plan for the risks and also plan for the upsides. Um, so thank you both. Thank you all for participating today. And I, I look forward to the remainder of the conversation. Let's be global and unstoppable together in a trusted community, the global tribe and global chamber.
Thank you all. Thank you, Doug, so much. Now I'd like to go to a couple of the participants who have attended. We have a new member in our New York City chapter, Jermiel Lewis Johnson. If you would unmute, we'd love to hear from you. Um, you have 30 to 30 seconds um, that you could do a pitch. You could go a little bit longer if you'd like, because I know it's the first time you've spoken publicly since you became uh, a member. So if you have anything you'd like to say, we'd love to hear it. Is Jermiel still here? Maybe not. Jermiel has been an important part of our clubhouse uh, community. We do every two weeks, we do an event and actually we met her through that. Um, and so we really appreciate Jermiel from Elmont, New York, uh, close to my home uh, in Bettinier Valley Stream in Westchester County. Is, did she join? She's here. I'm going to ask her to unmute, um, oh. but I don't, I don't see her responding. So she may be away from her computer. So she's uh, an amazing customs broker, does some really extraordinary work. And so check her out on LinkedIn. I will say, you know, it kind of relates to the trusted community concept because Jermiel came to us through kind of relatively random and clubhouse, but then she was verified by several people within our tribe to say she's really good at what she does. And so definitely check her out. I'll say also Lokesh, somewhat similarly, we met on clubhouse, I think just like a week ago. And it was very clear from our conversation that he's knowledgeable, he's thoughtful, and he's, he's got a lot to bring to the table. So we look forward to learning more about Lokesh uh, and, and Jermiel as well. But you know, let's keep building the global tribe with really talented, sincere, honest, professional people like these leaders. And we're gonna be more successful because of that. Back to you, Susan. Okay, I'd like to give BJ Sharma a minute to speak. BJ, are you available to speak? Okay. Yeah, man. Oh, go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Gabbard. No. Um, yes, okay. Huh? Okay. Um, Rob Arthurs, would you like to give uh, about 30 to 60 seconds about um, what you do? And I know you've uh, been uh, making some comments in the chat about production in Bangladesh. Would you like to speak? Sure, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, the great session this morning. Global Chamber always has great events and very enlightening. Uh, just a comment about the Bangladesh factories. And I, got, I know I've got a few comments back about the greening of the buildings, but the greening of the building doesn't necessarily mean the construction of the building uh, externally, like the rebar uh, that's used in the steel and are in the cement. And Canadian brands have been hammered and hammered in the press by some of the factories that are falling down because of poor construction with no rebar in the cement. And I'm just wondering if there's any sort of thing that the Bangladesh government is doing to, as they install all this great green and cutting edge equipment inside those buildings, what they're doing for the building themselves to keep the workers safe. And, uh, it, you know, as most recently, we've had a building that fell down there and it hurt a bunch of people. Susan, I think I can take this question because I was having this uh, conversation with me here a few days back. So, first of all, I think it's a two-way solution that we need to be talked about. Uh, I'm not going to blame game anybody, but we need to look at it from the perspective that, one, after the first Rana Plaza incident did happen, U.S. and European Union committees were formed and obligations were set in place. So there are uh, compliance factors that people have to follow or else they cannot you know, produce or they cannot supply to those countries. Uh, I know for a fact that even companies in my friend's network, they do not uh, you know, work anymore because they are non-compliant. So those compliance factors need to be looked into in the first place. The second, again, this is an appeal, I think, to the international community in the same way that Lokesh talked about it. A lot of buyers talk about compliance, but no one's thinking of giving maybe five cents extra. So I think we need to start putting you know, the money where our mouth is and really start saying that, hey, you gotta be compliant, but okay, I'm willing to give them better education. I'm willing to give them better health care and better standards. It, it, all of us have to do it together. I hope that answers your question. 
I have it's something to add. Uh, I have something to add, uh, Maimoon. That is, as I mentioned, that U.S. Um, importing a huge amount, even though this quarter, as I mentioned, it is 20% up from last quarter, last year, like from 8.25 to $9.65 billion. So I don't understand like why Canadian companies cannot do this, why they cannot find a compliant factories. So that means if you go to the right channel to find a compliance factory, and if you pay the right price with all the like compliance certification and everything, I believe it would be a very big challenge for you. So um, all over the world, Bangladesh government's industry is exporting. I don't know what is, what's wrong with Canada. So I believe it is, you have to find the right, right channel to get into the right, right people. That's all. Thank Rob, I hope you. that hey. through Global Chamber DACA, we can do that for you uh, and connect you yes. with sustainable factories. Maimon, I will just add uh, one thing to Imtiaz and what Maimon said. Uh, in India, we have production linked incentive to boost production and uh, boost uh, all the infrastructure thing. I think all over the world now, governments which who have committed to net zero, they should have an environmental link incentive. So any any buyer who's buying from China, Bangladesh, India, or whatever, and they can certify, they can prove that yes, it is coming from the verifiable sources. It's green. It's net zero effect is this much. They should be incentivized. And accordingly, the government of these manufacturing countries, they should also incentivize their manufacturing. Idea behind is doing is to stay competitive, but Always focus on environment. Agreed, one hundred percent. Thank you. Just what? Just what? I just wanted to um, see if is Famida on still. Famida. I'd like to yeah, give she's you a minute. Here. To I can see her. I can see her name. Okay, so Famida, would you like to speak briefly before we have about two minutes left? You're talking about Famida Ahmed Raka, right? Yes, I am. Amita Raka. I see her She's here. She's muted and uh, she, her video is off, so she might not be at the desk. Okay. Okay. All right. We have one question for Jasmine, which came from Alan, um, asking whether at any point are you planning to go global with uh, Warrior Women? And if so, maybe he has some ideas for you. you want to respond? Oh, yes. Um, what was his name? Alan. I'm not sure of his last name. Uh, yeah. Alexander. Hi, Alan. Uh, nice to meet you. Yes, actually, uh, I do plan to go global with Warrior Women, starting with events. That's really what's driven this in the first place. So um, if it weren't for COVID, <laughs> uh, Warrior Women, the event would have already gone global. So that was the plan actually in 2019. So I would like to start that again. If you have any ideas, please reach out to me. My email is jasmine at jasminesandler.com and it's in the chat. I'm more than happy to talk about global ideas for the brand. Will do, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Is there, thank you, Jasmine and Alan. Is there anyone else who would like to take the last minute and tell us a bit about your business? We have one more minute. Floor is open. Anyone? Okay, I think with that, Maymoon, I think we're gonna close the meeting. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for attending and Maymoon, um, if you have any closing comments, please share with us what you would like to say. It was a wonderful session. It was fabulous putting this together. And thank you, Lokesh, for joining us at, at, at the last minute. You certainly brought in a lot of speaker uh, attendees as well. You're a fabulous marketer, I can see. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Susan. I'll be very brief. Um, it's been enlightening to meet Jasmine. Um, good to know that Kurt has been in town. I hope if he ever comes to town again, I, I will be able to host him. Um, I can see a lot of synergies with the new uh, process that he wants to uh, implement. I, I think that would be great to work with in Bangladesh. He already has some experience. Uh, Mahir and Tiaz, thank you so much. Um, you know, we've got to know two different perspectives. Uh, Global Chamber is an amazing community. Um, I'd love to work with people like Susan. Uh, Doug is a great mentor, as always. And we are a family. We're one global tribe. So, um, what we want to do is make business easy, just like it's doing business across the street. So come in, join in, have a chat. Uh, from Global Chamber Dhaka, we have another event, but it's for a little bit of young leaders and we are focusing on their careers. It's on the 24th and it's at 8 p.m. Dhaka. And I think that would be 9 p.m. Eastern.
So feel free to join us. There's an event happening every day. There's multiple ha events happening every day. So um, stay tuned, stay in touch, do a lot of good business, and we're help and we're here to help. Hopefully, thank you so much. Have a great night and a good day. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Good night. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Namaskaram. Thank you.